in series in um, John, at least the eight signs and before then the seven I am statements. And we're getting into a very explosive, if you will, a very dynamic time in church history. It's a very, it's after, well, it begins with after Jesus' ascension and then he pours out the Spirit upon them. We'll see the early church come together. And if you guys were there last week for the joint service, the speaker... He shared from a passage in 2 Corinthians. I'm going to read this for you because I want you to understand something with the life that you and I lead. He talked about this treasure in jars of clay. And this is a part where I want to read for you. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Okay? Everything that is done in God's kingdom has never been about men. It's never been about the apostles. God uses them and to be sure to that end we ought to honor them. In the same way that we honor the um, missionaries or martyrs, the people who work in the church, in the same way that we honor them, we ought, we ought to honor the work that they do. But at the end of the day, it is God's all-surpassing power that shines through these jars of clay, you and I, and it's not us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body of the in our body in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. We are to live a life that is afflicted in every way, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. This is how the Christian ought to live his or her life. And you consider the life that you lead. And sometimes it's boring, I know. School can be like that. But this is not the all end all and be of your life. You're just beginning to experience what God has called you to. And when we look at the life of the apostles, and we wonder at the incredible, dynamic, spiritual movement that was inside their hearts and exploded onto the first century, we wonder why we can't live the same life. And we wonder why when we are reflected, we are despaired. And when we are, um, dis um, we are perplexed, we are thrown down into discouragement, when we are persecuted, we feel like we've been abandoned. Why is it that the modern Christian, same God, feels so spiritually vacant, whereas what we'll experience in the early church was something so powerful, so convicting? And it'll come down to the movement of the Spirit. So if you want to experience this life that talks about all these difficulties that we are promised that we will face, and yet a strength that comes deep inside from high above that helps us endure the all-surpassing power of God in your life. If you cannot say that you live in God's power this day, you need to listen up. If you cannot say that despite the discouragement or the boring days, there is purpose and joy in your life, you need to listen up. Because there is a spiritual vacuum there. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm saying you're missing out on a life that is fulfilling. So the next series that we're going to get into in our Friday night Bible study is going to be a John Piper series called Don't Least Your Life. And he talks very, very clearly about this idea of glorifying God with our bodies and how do we do so then if we're broken people. And he'll get into it and we'll get into the details of that. But basically the bottom line as we get into the book of Acts is it is the presence of the Spirit in your life. It has never been, never ever been the presence of a person. It has always been the presence of God. And in the passage on which that hymn that we sung is based upon Ebenezer, God's help for the people of Israel in that battle when he came and he shook them so that they fled, the help of the Lord God Almighty in today's day and age is the presence of the Spirit. And God told us very clearly, Jesus tells us in the Gospel of John, when I leave, I'm going to give you a helper. And when you think of all the ways that God helped his people in the Old Testament and the New in the powerful way that he shows up in the thunder and lightning, in the still way that he shows up to Elijah in the whisper, all those ways that God helps his people in the most impossible circumstances, you begin to understand the power that is in you this very day. Because the Spirit has been poured out. We'll read through the day when it actually came upon his people, but you and I live in a day and age when the Spirit is alive. Begs the question, so why aren't you alive? Why isn't the church alive? 
The Gospel of Luke is the first part of a two-part series, and the book of the Acts of the Apostles is the second part. So Luke is the one who writes them both. And he is an accurate historian. He's the physician of Paul, his travel mate. And it records very clearly because he's interested, and it starts off this way in our first verse. In the first book, O Theophilus, or Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up and after he had given commands to the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So basically Luke's saying, listen, I've told you to this point, this life of this man named Jesus. Now I'm going to tell you what happened when he left them. When the leader left them, when God incarnate ascended into heaven, I'm going to tell you what he left to them. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you what he did. And you're going to be blown away because this is not a movement of man, this is a movement of God. And we remember what the high priest said when Jesus was put on trial. And when the disciples are put on trial as they continue on in their um, expansion of the gospel. Every time, if it's a movement of God, you cannot stop it. And so we understand something about the day and age that we live in today. Jesus has ascended. That's a point in history. He has yet to come again. That's a point that is going to come in the future. You and I live in those two times and there's one thing that Jesus asked us to do. Dr. Stan was talking about the last words that you will share with the people that you leave behind. What will be your last words? And would you take the last words of somebody seriously? And Jesus tells him, okay, so many times in all four Gospels, and when something shows up in all four Gospels, you know it's a point of importance. So the resurrection appears in all four Gospels. The death, the whole passion narrative, the birth of Jesus. All that happens in all four Gospels at different points of ministry, they differ slightly. Because they want to draw out different things about the Jesus Christ that walked on this earth. But they all say the same thing towards the end as well. There's a great commission in every single one of the Gospels. The most well known is the one found in Matthew. Therefore, go out and make disciples of all nations. And that is what Jesus commands to his people. Go and make disciples. Now, something interesting happens here. Because sometimes we feel ill-equipped. Okay, so it'll be like this. I use this example, um, but hopefully it'll resonate with you guys in school. Okay, so go write your calculus exam. I'm in grade nine. What is calculus? Okay, so you're not ready to go write it. Even at the beginning of grade 12, if you haven't taken them or you haven't learned it in Hagwon, what is calculus? What does this mean? What is that squiggly sign? What are derivatives? What is all this stuff? What is a sine, a cosine, and tangent? What does that mean? And you have different ideas of what they are until you learn it. And then finally, when you are actually equipped to write the exam, now you're equipped to go. Because when God asks us to do something, we feel ill-equipped. And that's why Jesus says, I'm going to send you something. I'm going to send you a gift. The same thing I promised in the Gospel of John when I was speaking with you, the very presence of power that is in me, I'm going to leave to you. And so he says, as he presented himself alive to them after suffering by many proofs, we ended on one of those proofs. Jesus appears to the disciples and he, um, during the night, this is the last um, sign in the Gospel of John, and they catch this abundant amount of fish. He appears to them during, during 40 days in speaking about the kingdom of God. Because now he's got something that he wants his disciples to do. He has died. He's taken care of sin. He has resurrected. He has given us hope. And now he's got something for his disciples to do until the day he comes back again. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. Because here's who God is. He's not going to throw you into a situation where you're not going to be able to handle. He's not going to say, listen, write your captain's exam, you're in grade 8, ha ha, you're going to fail. He's not going to say, go out and preach the gospel, I'm not going to tell you what the gospel is. He's not going to say, I want you to do this in your life and never equip you and never give you the means to equip yourself. This is not the God who kind of teases you and waits for you to fail. If that's your view on God, you need to change it. He is a God who wants you to succeed in life, to enjoy life, to live life to the fullest. This is a God that you and I serve. And therefore, he orders the disciples, listen, before you go out, I know you're beginning to understand everything about why I had to come to down to this earth and die. I know that you're feeling encouraged because I've showed up to you for 40 days. I've encouraged you, I've showed you that there is life beyond that. But before you go out, don't even think about leaving Jerusalem. But wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard me for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days 
from now. You stay in Jerusalem until you receive what is necessary for you to take on this kingdom work. Because God does not send out his people, his daughters and his sons without being equipped. And so we play this game with God sometimes. But I'm not equipped yet. I'm only this age. I'm only this big. I haven't, don't have my degree yet. And I'm going to say you have no excuse because that command to stay in Jerusalem applied only to the disciples. And once Acts 2 hits and the Spirit is poured out upon all his people, no disciple afterwards has an excuse to stay put to where they are. You're called to go out. And going out doesn't necessarily mean you've got to go all the way to China or Africa or Haiti. It means going out in the front lines of wherever you are making a difference there. What is your front line? Is it your home? Is it your school? Okay, what are you known for in high school? How loud you are? How smart you are? How pretty you are? What your prom proposal was? What are you going to be known for when you graduate high school? The love that you showed, the care that you had, the way that you prayed, and you wanted people to know salvation. Because that, I tell you the truth, is what's going to be that matters. All these disciples that waited for the Spirit to come, and they gave up their lives for the kingdom message. When they died, they did not receive any glory from this world. And to this day, unless you are a Christian, you just kind of write them off as people in history. They're not the Napoleons, they're not the Caesars, they're not the, you know, the the great men of history. They're the ones that kind of built up the church and now we have this religion. But those of us who are in the church begin to understand that this is a life that mattered. This is a life that was unwasted. This is a life that means something at the end. This is a life that brings glory, that brings glory to God. And the challenge is, this book of Acts, which records the apostles' reaction to the Great Commission, what is your reaction? What is your response to the Great Commission? Oh, later, after I get my degree, after I become cool or whatever it is, after I chase after these things, then I'll give it all for the glory of God. And that is what John Piper will explicitly call the wasted life. Chasing after things that do not matter. And we heard it last Sunday as well. The things that we see with our eyes are temporary. They will pass away. The things that are unseen, seeable only by the eyes of faith, seeable only if the Spirit helps us reveal, help, reveals it to us, that is what matters. That is the life that these disciples will live. And this is what we'll see in this Acts of the Apostles. You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So wait in anticipation. So there is the promise that God gave. Okay? I want you to wait until the Holy Spirit. And this is the command that comes afterwards. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Because they're curious as to what's going to happen. When are you going to come again? What's going to happen? What does it mean for the Spirit to come? They have all these questions. And Jesus says to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. Okay. You don't need to know what your life is going to look like when you're 30. You have now to live. You don't need to know when Jesus is going to come again because he's given you clear instructions on what to do until he comes. And in fact, the Bible is very clear. Until the nations are evangelized, he's not going to come. So this gives you input, this gives you reason, this gives you urgency to spread the gospel message. It's very clear. Jesus will come again. That's the other promise in this passage. The first promise is the presence of the Holy Spirit. The second one, that he's going to come again in the same way that he went up. And in between those times, he's given us the Spirit to do something, and that's the command. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria to the ends of the earth. To the very ends of the earth you will go. And that's when you will go to take his name high. To the ends of the earth that you, people will know that you are God. We just sang those words. Now the question is, in your homes, do your parents recognize that in your life, Jesus is Lord? Do your friends at school, when they talk to you, do they recognize that you don't live just for school and for the cool things, that Jesus is Lord? In wherever you are right now, never mind the ends of the earth, because here you are today, this is the end of the earth, by the way, for some people in other parts of the world, but wherever you are, do people, when they look at your life, know that Jesus is 
is God. Know that He is your Savior, that you are sold out living for Him, or have you hidden it under all these other things that you're so concerned about that don't matter when you get older, let alone when you get to heaven. Because that's what it takes. That's the kind of mental shift it's going to take for you young people to rise up to be a strong generation, to harness that spirit and experience that power, to go to the ends of the earth, to recognize that power that is in you, and to lay hold of that promise. You're going to have to recognize in your life what has taken place with God. Because the Holy Spirit is available for all of us here today. He is alive. He is working. And the reason why He doesn't work sometimes is because we're not available to be used by Him. He's not incapable. He's not dead. He's not absent. We are. I'd like to use this example. So sometimes you guys go to your tutors or maybe let's use calculus again. You go to your calculus tutor because you need help because you don't understand a certain concept. And the, your calculus tutor is like genius. He's like Elder In. He's like Elder John In. Like math just comes like water to him, okay? He understands it. And he's willing to explain everything to you. He's just waiting for you to give him some time. But as soon as he starts getting into it, okay, my friend called, I gotta go. Sorry, tell the name, I gotta go. And you just take off, and he's like, oh, I was just getting into it with you. And he's like, okay, I'm patient. Wherever you need help, I'm always here. I'll meet you at church, you can come over, you, can, you know, whatever. He's always available for you, but you're never checking in to learn it. And then you get to your exam, you vomit, and it's like, well, you had it. I was here to help you. And at the end of that exam, you wonder, what a wasted semester, because you didn't get a credit out of it. What a wasted life. At the end, when you get to heaven, and there's nothing to show for, but whatever it is that you have you know, so eagerly chased after on this earth, but you cannot even take her. The disciples that gave up their lives when they heard this command, the conviction, the passion with, they, which, with, with which they went out to spread the gospel. That is a life that every single one of you are called to. And if you're not living it, if you don't want it, that's a different story. But if you're not living it and you want it, you need to understand what comes first. In John chapter 14, verses 12, this is what Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And we know what Jesus did. We read about those eight signs, and he's done much more than that. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. I've been on this earth for 33 years. I've done ministry for three, Jesus says. When I go up, I'm going to give you the presence of the Spirit, the very power that is in me. Now, I'm limited because for the 33 years on this earth that I spent, I was limited by this human body, but when I give you the Spirit, it will be unlimited, unconstrained, uncontainable power for my people. And it will be with you. And everything that you saw me do, from the resurrection of Lazarus, turning water into wine, walking on water, you will do greater things. And when you read the Acts of the Apostles, I will encourage you to follow along, read ahead. You will see what they do. Poisonous snakes that bite Paul, he just shakes it off. People just want to walk by and just have Peter and Paul's shadow cast over them so they can be healed. They preach and somebody tries to teach the church, those people fall dead on the spot. God is powerful and he works when people are filled with the Spirit. So the question remains, what are you filled with? What are you filled with? The command that he gives us to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. To speak, I'm sorry, let's go back to that verse. Um, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. So Jesus physically... Okay, and his physical body is no longer on this earth as we read this passage. And when they were gazing into heaven, he went. Behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the life that you and I are called to lead. It's not the American dream. The American dream shatters when you're like 45 or 50. It makes no difference in eternity. It's a life of power. It's a life of saving souls. It is a life 
that anticipates the return of Jesus Christ. And so this passage for today is couched in two promises and one command. The first promise, the coming of the Spirit. I will equip you for what I'm just about to tell you. Okay, I'm going to equip you to go out and spread the gospel to all the ends of the earth. And the other promise, because there will be the day that I come again. And the question that I want you guys to think about is, how are you living your life? Oswald Chambers says this, When it is a question of God's almighty spirit, never say, I can't. Because false humility and this idea that you cannot do anything in this life because, I don't know, people have told you that, you're not good looking enough, you're not tall enough, you're not smart enough, is actually very arrogant. Because it never was you. And so you ask me, what are the qualifications of do, doing something in God's will? And you'll bring me all of your you know, work hours, your job experience, your highest marks, your citizenship, all the sports that you play. And I'll say, you're, you'll bring me your money. And I'll say, none of this makes any difference. The only X factor in doing God's work is the Holy Spirit. You can have all the gadgets you want. But the Spirit is not in a worship service. You can have all the PowerPoint laser shows. You can have the best praising. If the Spirit is not present, it is just music. It is just religious talk. When the Spirit is present, there's conviction, and there's life, and there's transformation. That's the difference in any one of your lives. So don't bring a sullen face to the table of God. Bring everything you have, and watch Him make it grow. None of these men were considered the top people of their society when Christ called them. All they did was follow. And even in their following, they failed. But as they get into the early church and as Christ really prepares them for the work that they have, now that they begin to understand, He equips them with the Spirit, the same one that is available to you all. And end with this quote. Ian Bounds says this. What the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more novel methods, but men and women whom the Holy Spirit can use. Men of prayer, women of my, who are mighty, in prayer. We talked about this during the retreat. You want to get to know the Spirit, you want to fill in your life, you've got to talk to God. You've got to receive that Spirit, you've got to read the Bible and understand the promises and be empowered to do His work. Some of you guys, I know even as I speak, you doubt what these greater works are in your life. And one of the reasons why you see a lot of these greater works in the mission field is because when you're on the mission field, you rely on nothing but God. You don't know the language, you don't know the food, there's no, you know, no place where you can run to. You really have to rely simply on prayer. But in our comfortable church, in our homes, we have so many things that we rely on, so many things that we would rather pursue. The early church, when they began, they were persecuted. They didn't have a lot of people. They didn't have educated theologians or seminaries. They had to rely purely on the Spirit. And there's some humility that comes with that attitude. And the power comes when we're completely dependent upon it. It's great that God has blessed you with all sorts of skills and talents and blessings. But that is not your claim to God's kingdom or the work that He's going to do for you. You really need the Spirit. Stuff of this world, you can be a successful businessman, you can make a lot of money. You want to use it for God? You have to have the Spirit. And so that's our blessing. That's our prayer for you guys as we get into the book of Acts. As we get through these sermon series, I hope and pray that you guys will be filled with the Spirit. That you'll be ready to go out on missions this summer. That you'll be ready to change your schools when you go back in September, maybe even now. And that you'll be ready to experience revival in your life, in your family, and in this ministry. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we just pray for the Spirit's anointing in this place. We confess again, Lord, that sometimes we're so dulled down by the patterns of this world. Our thinking, our hearts, boredom threatens to distract us. We just pray, Lord, that our minds would be sharp, that our spirits would be longing for you, that we take the command that you've given us and really be convicted by the fact that there are souls out there that will never be in heaven because no one has cared about them. But you do, and you have asked us to care about them in the same way that you do. So, Father, give us a mental paradigm shift. Give, our, give us a transformation, an overhaul, if you will, of our spiritual lives so that we might go to the ends of the earth, beginning at the front lines in our homes and in our schools. Make us a ministry of prayer. May your spirit be poured out upon every single son and daughter of yours in this room. May their families be changed. May this church be the true light and salt of the earth. In Christ's name we pray. Very quickly before 